Okay, we are recording. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, welcome to Activism, Allyship, and Advocacy, a training designed by three Black women in this organization. Um, and basically, our whole premise is the first quote, the revolution will not be a diversity and inclusion training. Um, please pay attention. This is going to be like very conversation based. We just want to take what we learned from love in the last section and share our stories and our experiences. We are by no means experts. We're just three black girls trying to navigate our way through the world. Um, and also like this is a constant reminder that learning is, is a necessity for everything in life, especially activism. Activism is all about learning and unlearning. So take this time to like take in what we're saying and maybe learn a few things and unlearn a few other things. So yeah, enjoy. So this is us. <laughs> um, Brooke, you want to introduce yourself? Okay. Hi, everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Brooke Solomon. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm from Detroit, Michigan. This year, or I've been in HCA for two years now, and I've served on like every single um, like level of position you can. I started my own local chapter in my high school, thanks to one of my good friends, Sadia. I served as Michigan chairwoman and um, on the on that staff. But what some of you don't know about me is that I am a grassroots activist and organizer in Detroit. And my baby is Detroit Area Youth United Michigan, also known as DAM. And it's a activist organization that's youth run and youth led. It's a 501c3. And we have been around for two years now. We began um, as a group who organized the Detroit March for Our Lives. And we decided that we wanted to stay and organize together. And the past two years have been incredible. We have hosted summits. We have hosted trainings, um, a March for Our Lives One Year Later event. We have a COVID-19 task force right now. We've done water testing. And I'll get more into like the details of what DAM does. But DAM is, is definitely an example of youth activism and like community involvement at its core. So I'll pass it over to Love. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, we stand, of course. My name is Love Lundy. As I mentioned, um, I am currently in Edgewater, New Jersey. I have done activism work. I started off um, kind of advocating for Black Lives Matter in middle school, and that's what kind of um, promoted me to token activist, if you will. Um, but <clears throat> after the special election for Doug Jones, when I met Ariana Smart, um, we planned the Huntsville March for Our Lives together, and I kind of got a beginning look into what organizing really looked like and how I could be helpful, and I just kind of fell in love with it. Um, since then, I've interned on a congressional campaign. I have bussed with March for Our Lives around the country. I'm working on gun violence prevention work and registering people to vote. Um, and I share my story a lot. So I will pass it on to Claire with that. Thank you, love. Uh, my name is Claire Tando. I am currently in Charlotte, North Carolina. <laughs> um, and basically, I started this, um, I guess you call it like a resource hub, like a safe space for youth of color uh, called Kids Fed Up. Um, full transparency, just kind of tired of, you know, these progressive so-called student organizations um, that really aren't giving us the spaces to actually get involved and take action. Um, I'm really passionate about direct action and getting my feet on the ground um, in case of like passive activism, just posting on social media. Um, and yeah, I just do a lot of work within my community and I try to help others build their communities as well. So. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself there. So, um, politics is personal. Just considering the fact that it is about, you know, the governing of people. Um, so we kind of just want to make it 
really clear that black people in this country never started from the same spot, from the same starting line um, as any other race that exists in this country. Uh, yesterday at the protest in Edgewater, a really, really beautiful speaker um, brought up the Immigration Act of 1965, I believe it is, and was just kind of talking about how um, immigration to this country in the 60s, like you were not allowed to come to America if you were not deemed educated. So whatever, despite, you know, I mean, I don't want to say despite, but acknowledging the issues, obviously, that um, non-Black people of color um, in this country have experienced, um, you know, Black people were captured and brought to this country to do unpaid manual labor. They weren't required to be educated because they weren't considered as people. So never believe that you really fully understand where a black person is coming from <laughs> because you're never starting from the same starting point. It's about um, the dimensions of racism that are mentioned here. And I'll pass it on to Brooke with that. Yeah. So. One of the key points that we thought about when coming up with this training is that we don't want to do all the educating for you. Like, honestly, right now, Black people are so tired in this country. Like, we are exhausted. We are on the ground. We are organizing. And we cannot be everyone's teacher. Um, and so, but this is a way for all of you to start thinking about, like, identity politics and social justice on your own. And so a lot of the questions and a lot of the things that we see in terms of like, why is everything about race? The system is broken and diversity and inclusion like come from people who like rely on black women um, for like intellectual labor. And so starting with the first point, like why is everything about race? It's not all about race. It's about everyone's identity and the intersections of those identities. Um, the lives and the bodies of Black women are inherently political. I mean, we have seen this from slavery abolition to the civil rights movement to uh, the fight for reproductive justice. Like our identities and um, our bodies are always on the chopping block in terms of like court cases and laws and just be like people see us as debatable. Um, and it is a privilege not to be constantly politicized and have your identity um, basically laid out on the table for people to inspect and see if you're worthy of, of rights, if you're worthy of autonomy. Um, another thing that we hear a lot is that the system is broken. The system is not broken. It's not. The system, the system that we talk about when it comes to like systems of oppression are operating exactly how they should be, and that is to oppress. You know, to say that the system is broken overlooks um, the institutions of white supremacy and it's a way to evade responsibility by saying oh no the system is broken it's fine like it's we can just come up with a new system no the system is running like i said is running exactly how it should be and it is now our duty and our responsibility to build a better system and um i'll say this from on behalf of me love and claire like we are very very tired of like the guise of diversity and inclusion because at the end of the day like that doesn't mean anything um when we talk about diversity and inclusion like it's just about oh we need more of these people we need more of these people but then you're just bringing people into unsafe spaces you're bringing people into toxic spaces and that just really centers like a white lens of improvement you know we just need more color we just need to be more colorful like no we need laws we need systemic change we need like exact things, not just diversity and inclusion. And I see like a lot with um, the Black Lives Matter movement and what's going on right now, like people are beginning to see what we actually need as a country. And that is not another diversity and inclusion training to teach white people and non-black people how to be better people or how to not be racist. Because like you can't, I can't teach you how to be a better person. And I, I certainly like will not. Um, so Claire. Um, yeah, so first things first, like 
I just want to make it clear that racism is rooted in America um, and not just America, but this is a global thing, right? Um, and based on what Brooke and Love has said previously, yes, this is the Black Lives Matter movement, but realize that this is our livelihood. Like, it is also a matter of life or death. Saying a Black person saying Black Lives Matter is literally like we feel threatened by the police. We feel obviously threatened by racism. It's not like we can no longer answer the questions of like, why is this happening? Can't believe it's 2020 and this is still going on. Like that, that's no longer acceptable, right? Um, and to remember not to be not racist, but anti-racist and actively, um, not just you call out a microaggression from your friend and not just educating your racist family members, but taking it upon yourself to unlearn your implicit biases um, and prejudice. So yes, um, go ahead and take a look at that, uh, what's called that graphic too, and a close look because it's deeper than just surface, oh, I'm so sorry, deeper than just surface level, um, like microaggressions, like it's, it's deep, um, but yes. <laughs> so this quote comes from uh, Rennie Edo Lodge in the book, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, and it's, I don't want to be included. Instead, I want to question who created the standard in the first place. After a lifetime of embodying difference, I have no desire to be equal. I want to deconstruct the structural power of a system that marks me out as different. I don't wish to be assimilated into the status quo. I want to be liberated from all of the negative assumptions that my characteristics bring. The same on us is not, is not on me to change. Instead, it's the world around me. And honestly, like we put this quote in here because it really ties in to like when we think about like diversity and inclusion, oh, it's just about like bringing more people into a said space to make it more diverse when in reality we need to be dismantling and deconstructing spaces that were never diverse or inclusive in the first place. Um, and I think that this is, this is definitely a big part of like my activism that I'm now starting to like step into. Like, like I said, this is a constant learning experience and I'm starting to learn, like, instead of saying, oh, I want like a seat, like I want to seat at the table. Like I'm, I no longer want to say that because I don't want there to be a table. Like, it's not only like you progress from, I want to be at the head of the table to, I don't want there to be a head of the table. I want it to be a circle and everyone's equal to, I want there to be no table because no one should have the power to determine who gets rights and who does not and who has access and access to power and the ability to use it. And it's really interesting that you bring this up Brooke because this morning in preparation for um, a speaker that we have later this week um, she was talking about the fact she said basically exactly what you just said like she was talking about how Shirley Chisholm is one of her biggest inspirations and how Shirley Chisholm's idea is to bring a, was to bring a folding chair to the table and that her expanded philosophy is that, you know, don't bring a seat to the table, redesign the table, refashion the table. And I was like, this is why I love you. So yes, social justice, sorry, okay. There's things on my screen that love to um, block things. So I just can't see. Okay, social justice and grassroots organizing. So grassroots organizing, as the slide mentions, builds community groups and unites um, the community from scratch and by grassroots methods. So developing new leadership. And when we say that, we really want to highlight intersectional leadership. Um, and organizing the unorganized. It is a values-based process, as personal narrative is, where people are brought together to act in the interest of their communities and the common good. So do you see how you can use personal narrative in activism so easily? Like literally everything that this just described about social justice and grassroots organizing, you have the tools to do through using your own stories. And it's because of that one idea, values. Um, let's remember that, as Brooke said, this learning and this work is continuous. Um, 
So you're never done. I'm never done. Brooke and Claire are never done learning, right? It's about learning more about yourself and understanding your identity and understanding how your identity affects the, those around you. And, you know, unless you're some world traveler, I don't really think you're going to meet every single person that there is to meet. So understand that you have to continue to change. Uh, if you guys don't have, oh, you have some. Yeah. Um, so unlike <laughs> some white boys from Massachusetts may say, door knocking is not activism. And when we say social justice isn't inherently, it's inherently political, but politics are not inherently socially just, we mean that not all politics, even democratic politics, fight for people. Um, and when we say social justice is inherently political, we mean that our lives are defined by laws, unfortunately, and we mean that social justice operates outside of the binary of American politics. So like with DAM, like we are not a political organization, like a lot of us are Democrats or leftists, got a few socialists, got a few communists, but <laughs> we don't operate, like our work does not operate inside of a binary system. Um, and the work that we do is community-based, it's about self-preservation and it's about liberating ourselves. And so one thing um, to highlight from Dam's work, if you look on the pictures, the blue shirt that says Dam, that was at the Detroit Youth Climate Strike that we organized in September. And the picture next to that was from an adult ally training because we also wanna make sure that we're not only training ourselves, but our elders and making sure that they know um, what youth activism is really about. And our work is, very very fluid it's very real time it's very hands-on unlike like say you know you work on a campaign you have to make phone calls you have to door knock you have to vote whereas like social justice work is very reactionary in a lot of cases especially when you talk about direct actions it this happened and now we have to counter it with this so an example of that in dam's work was in 2018 um was it 2018 yeah 2018 to 2019 school year so last year uh, Detroit public school students, and I'm, I'm a DPS school student, we went back to school and we found out that we had no running water because it was contaminated with elevated levels of lead and copper. And so we found that out basically two days before we went back to school and our conditions in school like for the rest of the year would be based on like water coolers and individual bottled water. And I know some of the people from my school's chapter are here, but I go to a huge school. It is six floors and we have 2,500 kids, not kids and staff and teachers and administrators, 2,500 kids. And that sort of situation prompted a reaction from DAM because a lot of our body is young people from Detroit public schools. And so what we did as a reaction, as hands-on real-time work, is we organized a strike against our school. <laughs> This sounds so weird saying it, but we, we literally hosted a strike against our school um, on count day, which is a day that um, the, our school gets our funding based on each student. And so we basically wanted to hold them accountable as in you can't count us unless you recognize us as people who are deserving of clean water. Um, and so we did a strike on count day. And then because our social justice is rooted in our community and our love for ourselves, we then countered that with a um, water testing initiative in the neighborhoods of the three schools that tested highest for lead and copper. So not only did we have to fight against our school, fight against our administration and risk, um, risk detention, risk suspension and expulsion. Um, that was one of the hardest things that I've ever organized because it's in the context, like in the confines of your school. And so you're basically, you're fighting against your teachers, your pe the people who have power over you. Um, but our social justice um, sort of lens is centered around community and a love for ourselves. And that's why we did the work that we did. So we were able to hold a strike and test water to over to like 200 residents. I don't know, that was last year. Um, and we ended up getting um, clean water. We have, this year's definitely was way better. Um, but we also were able to level our power as young people, as students against our administration and show not just ourselves, 
but our school and our community in the world that we have power in our direct actions, in um, disrupting spaces, in being multifaceted and able to work in different parts. Um, and as social justice activists and grassroots organizers, organizing outside of the context of politics in a binary system, because it wasn't like, oh, the Republicans turned off our water or the Democrats didn't let us, you know, get fancy drinking coolers, like it was something else. So we had to go in it as something else. And so that's what's really important about social justice and grassroots organizing is that it's making space when there isn't any. Um, and it's about becoming the solution that you want and not leaving it up to the system to create one. And so that's why there are so many lanes of activism. There are direct actions, there's art, like, like Love who makes her music, there's community engagement, like, it's activism is about joy and like that's really what we center like i think of it um a lot like uh avatar the last airbender and zuko's character arc where he like lost his firebending abilities for a brief time because it was rooted in his anger yes fave show <laughs> it was rooted in his anger um but then when he got with ang and the rest of the gang like he found a new passion a new well that wasn't based on something that was detrimental to something based in hate. It was based in love and about this new community that he found. And that's where he got his firebending abilities back. And so like, there are so many great, thank you. Um, there are so many great ways to look at social justice and grassroots organizing because it's a part of our lives. It's part of our existence and we cannot separate from it. So sorry I talked so long, uh, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. Um, so for me, uh, I'm just gonna start with the picture on the very, very left, the black and white picture, um, then kids fed up. I guess that's like my, my representation. So first things first, when I first come to HSDA, before I met Brooke or Love, um, I was already kind of tired of like adults being in the, the forefront. And then if it was, and if, if it, there were students that were in the forefront, they were usually straight, white, um, not really inclusive of everybody. And I didn't really know what to do at all. And in my city in particular, like nobody is really organized, like nobody's really together. Um, they don't like it. Usually it's pretty, um, it's the right word. Yeah, it's just not organized, I guess. Um, and so when I started Kids Fed Up, it was hard because I didn't really know where to take it. I just knew like I wanted to do some type of educational thing and I wanted to do some type of community building. Unfortunately, because of, um, George Floyd's death, you know, there were protests and whatnot. And I was never, obviously, like, my plan was never to make a protest, like, because who, a Black life being senselessly killed is not, like, a matter for me to uh, be like, oh, you know, I'm going to start something. So after the protest, I held the NAACP in my city had reached out to me. And I was so grateful um, after I'd organized everything and even broken love or that whole week, a week and a half, I did not eat, sleep and whatnot. Um, and it was one of the largest protests in my city. And I say that to say like how worried I was and seeing like news coverage of it was like crazy. And to this day, like it's still growing and I'm still doing community things. And I have like people in Connecticut that are like reaching out to me like, hey, how can I do this here? How can I do that there? And sometimes, you know, people will try to invalidate you, like, based on what you're doing. They'll make you seem like, oh, you don't really know, or, like, in a way, like, oh, you're going to try and, um, sorry, or in a way, like, you have to try and do something else. But you honestly have to stick to your gut when you do a lot of these things. Obviously, reach out to people and find your community, but understand that you will be your biggest advocate, and in fighting for people as well, you have to believe in yourself, right? As cliche as that sounds. But when you do work like this, confidence is incredibly important. Um, so yes, I think I'm just going to leave off with saying that believe in yourself because you know you're your biggest advocate. So yeah, I'll leave off with that. <laughs> yeah, so um, if anybody's taking notes, we just kind of talked about this um, in the last slide, but I want to highlight again that everything or not everything but a lot of the things that Brooke said specifically thinking talking about binary choices and binary thinking um identity the table whatever the table is 
um, are all things, and we literally didn't talk about this before, but are, are all things that are brought up in uh, Representative Presley's Breakfast Club interview, which um, I hope that you guys all watch. It's like an hour long interview and I, I'll have the link later on. Um, but I form, we formed the questions for the interview for Representative Presley from that interview. So yeah, y'all have notes on this one. Like, can you go back for a second? Lauren? Sure. Sorry, this is one of the things like when I talk about constantly learning, like this is something that I really had to learn um, coming into like activism spaces. And I think that it's really paramount for black activists or just activists period to take inspiration and to take lesson and, and be led by the people who came before us. Um, and so when we talk about movement building and we talk about like movements that are happening, like Black Lives Matter, for instance. Um, movements for social justice are at every cornerstone of, of American history, and they serve as a way for marginalized people to fight for themselves, build political power, and achieve liberation. So movements form as a collective consciousness of a community and its allies as they bend towards justice. And so like we see like a lot of the, the protests that sparked uh, this past month were because of George Floyd's death, but the work that was being done wasn't just because of him, it was because black liberation movements have always existed from um, slavery abolition to civil rights to black power movements in the 70s to mo the modern day movement for black lives, which includes Black Lives Matter. And so a lot of the, the things that we're talking about weave in between um, de jure and de facto, which de jure is like in law. So like these are actual laws like segregation laws, whereas de facto is in practice um, it's in fact, so how do you move around? How do you... Um... You want me to go to that slide? Oh, this is the slide. Oh, okay. Yeah, we move things around. Sorry, okay. love. It's okay. <laughs> um, and so, like, a lot of the inspiration that I take is from Black liberators, especially, like, Black women radicals. Um, and the components of, of Black movements were education. It was mass consciousness building. It was community centered, you know, during the civil rights movement, people gave up their homes, their churches, food, their bodies and their intellectual labor for movements to continue. And our resistance is a way where we center each other and we build collective power through education and building a new vision for a better world. Um, so sorry, I'm gonna explain a few things really quickly, especially about like, misconceptions uh, of like black movements, especially the civil rights movement, because a lot of times like the history of the movement, movements for black liberation, like I said, have existed for 400 plus years. Um, and a lot of them are oversimplified, they're watered down, they're butchered, and many times like they're whitewashed to fit like a sort of like comfortable idea. And we see that a lot like with where people feel the need to quote MLK to like oppose protesters or rioters. Um, and that really just shows how like the history of these movements and the history of people's actions have been so watered down. And with that comes like a toxic hero complex. Like Martin Luther King was not alone in his actions. His work um, was not just about him or his message. And like people like Rosa Parks, like these pillars when we think of the civil rights movement did not act alone. And yet in history books, we only see them alone and we only see part of their stories. Like Rosa Parks was not some seemingly old lady who didn't want to get up from her seat on the bus. She was an experienced organizer who took on that role because there was already years of movement work behind her to support her. Um, in many like instances, black women are left out of the conversation when we were the pillar, we were the structure of the civil rights movement. And a lot of the faces that you see are of men, are of, are of only black men holding, you know, am I not a man sign, signs. And that completely ignores like the history of black women organizers and the power that we have. Um, black women led, we educated, we gave our homes, we gave our energy. And now like we are just discredited and overshadowed. And so we need to pay homage to the women who did the work, the behind the scenes work and the in the scenes work, people like Ella Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer and Daisy Bates, um, because black women, like our whole ideology is that we know that it can't just be one person because we know what it feels like to be on the bottom. We know what it feels like to be 
left out and overshadowed. And so what we do is in collective mass. Um, and so that's how those, these movements continue. And that's how we have microcosms of these movements um, of a greater like fight for black liberation. Um, and so all of the work that uh, we do or we're involved in is from the past and the present. And we should respect all of the people who laid their lives and gave their energy and their time to making sure that these things happen. So like black feminist theory and black radical activism by the likes of Angela Davis and Asada Shakur, like we cannot forget the women who put their lives on the line. We also cannot forget that movements are not one thing. You literally cannot put a whole movement into a history textbook unless it is the whole book. Um, and so that's why I like going into this quote by Angela Davis, if one looks at the history of struggles against racism in the US, no change has ever happened simply because the president chose to move in a more progressive direction. Every change that has happened has come as the result of mass movements. And so in so many ways, history tries to like eliminate the power of mass movements, especially black mass movements. But we have to remember that every single thing that we have fought for and won and everything that we have inspired others to do has come from movement work and building power and direct actions and behind the scenes and all of these things that make movements what they are. And we cannot forget that and we cannot tell single stories and we cannot only give bits and pieces of, of movement history. And so that's why it's really on us to educate and to learn and relearn a lot of these things. So Claire, if you wanna add anything, sorry. Um, yeah, so basically full transparency, we were all taught white lies in our history books. Um, so as of right now, if you think you know things about African American history, you don't, um, and you should go educate because we were not told in full. Um, and based on what they're saying, I'm going to go into a little bit of the fact that all black lives matter. Um, and usually when we think about the face of these movements, it's straight black males, right? And whenever we do go into talking about black women or black trans women, or um, anybody that identifies differently than a straight black man, immediately it's almost like people um, disregard them or they don't pay as much attention. Um, and it's really disheartening because we are fighting for all black liberation, right? Um, and so we need to make sure that we don't only focus on certain groups of people and we do not invalidate or be insensitive to other groups of people as well. Um, there's a lot of things that we have to unlearn when it comes to that, especially um, going back to like bringing a seat at the table. Well, if you think about something as like voting rights, um, of course, white men, white people got their right to vote and then white women. And then after that, it was a whole other group of um, POC and then finally black women. And it's just like, it goes on and on and on like that. And of course the table has to be restructured because um, we were never even there when they were making the blueprints to create the table. So that's why we have to create a whole new one. Um, but yes. <laughs> Got him. So um, we have been talking a lot about intersectionality. Um, I want to make a couple of points on this. I am a Black, let's start over, queer Black, disabled woman. And so I occupy lots of spaces. Um, and something that we'll discuss with Representative Presley is this idea of the weathering effect and this idea that oppressed people go through so much and I think the weathering effect is specifically about black people but go through so much that they don't realize what they have experienced or they don't realize how it affects them um, and this applies more specifically to like parents not understanding how severe their child's health issues are um, you know, a person downplaying the trauma that they experience in their community or internally daily um and on that note people internalizing pain and trauma that white people and non-black people of color don't even understand where the trauma is coming from um so intersectionality is important because 
when I say things like y'all don't even understand when I'm coming from, it has to not affect, um, affect you or, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Offend you because that's privilege. Um, you have a privilege to, to not be aware of the layers of, of, of issues that black women, black queer women, disabled black people are exposed to. Um, so Brooke and Claire, do y'all have stuff on that? Um, you wanna go Brooke or me? You can go. You can go. All right. Um, when it comes to intersectionality, I think people see it as like a black and white issue, um, right? Like they don't necessarily understand how in depth it goes. Like, for example, like climate justice is racial justice. And people will be thinking like, well, how do you know the same people asking like, well, why does race have to be brought into everything? Well, that's why. You understand? Like a lot of black children have asthma. There's no discrepancy there. Like it's done on purpose. Um, for instance, I know this is like trailing way off, but um, the black mortality rate, especially black women and pregnancy, like medical racism. It's like I said previously when I got on the call that racism is so deeply rooted in America that certain things when we talk about it and maybe like, oh, that's uncomfortable or that's controversial. The gag is that we've been too comfortable. Black people maybe not as comfortable because we've always kept an eye out. But we've been way too comfortable with addressing these issues and going into how in depth. Because just like simply walking down the street, right? I can't walk down the street at night because I am a young woman, but I also can't walk down the street because I am a young black woman. And for the fact that I have my hair cut, somebody's going to think I'm a young black man. And then at the same time, because of their prejudices and implicit bias, right? Like you guys, you guys get the point. So it's just like, I already can't walk outside at night. I already can't have my hood on while I'm walking. It's like certain things like these that you guys have to think about that goes into basic daily things things such as like code switching people don't really even realize when they're doing it but you could literally be on the phone and people say that um they'll switch between a white voice and their regular voice because they'll get um they'll get more jobs that way or people will be more receptive that way because for some odd reason when black women especially speak apparently we're aggressive i don't really know where that notion comes from but that's i i guess that's what it is um so my point being that intersectionality goes deeper than just um, the issues we talk about when it comes to I identification. Uh, it literally goes into our daily lives. Yeah. Um, just to touch on where intersectionality comes from, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw is an amazing author and activist who coined this term and coined the phrase because she saw that Black women existed at the intersection of two major identity, identities, race and gender. And in that intersection, we were left behind and we were forgotten. And a lot of, we can see that a lot in history when we talk about the civil rights movement being led by men. And it was about men getting their rights and men getting, black men getting to the position of white men in society. And we counter that with the movement, the women's liberation movement in the 70s and women's right to vote and the fact that white women got their right to vote in 1920 but women of color and black women did not. And so there was, there was sexism in the civil rights movement, there was racism in the women's rights movement. And so where does that leave black women? Where does that, where does that leave women of color? It leaves them at the intersection and it leaves them forgotten. Um, and even we go as far as even to say like LGBTQ plus liberation movements, like gay liberation movements are, uh, can exist and still be transphobic and can still have like aspects of racism that deter major communities who sit at the intersection of a lot of things, black queer women um, from like getting involved in these things. And so uh, like we see intersectionality a lot in the movements that we see like now, like major um, organizations, like we see major organizations like March for Our Lives fighting for gun violence or gun violence prevention. And like what we don't see is that a lot of a lot of like aspects of organizing are like inherently racialized and so like we when we talk about like gun violence prevention we have to talk about police brutality we have to talk about police abolition uh we have 
we have to talk about poverty and we have to talk about what crime is in the prison industrial complex because if you're not doing that you're not looking at like the problem of gun violence at an interse like in an intersectional way and so like what intersectionality is not it is it is not an identity it's not synonymous with race like it's not it is definitely not an adjective it's a noun it's something that you you work in it's something that that um that you that your work embodies and it is definitely not like a way to like it is not like a new age word for diversity it was coined by black women and it should be like respected as a powerful tool of organizing and self-liberation so yeah um so just very quickly before like this will probably tie into what we're about to talk to next but i want to talk about um the fem the feminism aspect of intersectionality um and how peak white feminism has a lot to do with intersectionality so i'll just give an example you guys understand the whole girl boss narrative the whole like i'm an entrepreneur right usually that's straight white women who have you know done something necklaces whatever it may be but there's never diversity in there also saying diversity and inclusion are not buzzwords but to my point it's not inclusive at all and when it comes to the movement we don't just want women up there right we want women that identify with many different identities because we need different perspectives. We don't just need the same um, woman or uh, a male that is um, more progressive in, in these positions. Um, and, as, and as an ally to these communities, if you are ever like told, um, if you are ever told something to fix something or to be more inclusive or, which it shouldn't be an ask anyway, because you should already be learning that. But if you have to be corrective, you can't be defensive about it. And that's why when Brooke was mentioning earlier, like this isn't like an adjective, a word that you can just throw around to, um, to excuse like, okay, this is why I haven't been inclusive enough because I didn't understand that these issues connected. Like that's not an excuse, um, but yeah. Absolutely, very wise closing words. <laughs> on that slide from both of y'all. Um, so, for those of you who posted a black square, what are you doing now? Really great question to ask yourself and your friends who you know only posted a black square so that they continue to stay, you guys continue to stay friends. Um, take the following points into account. Your privilege, and the power that you possess because of your privilege. You can't deny your privilege. Like you must explicitly accept your privilege and your identity. Whoever you are, whatever your identity is, it is vital, vital, vital to learn who you are as a person and to understand that and to realize where you're coming from because it makes learning really difficult when you don't realize that you're not a black woman. I'll pass it to Brooke with that. <laughs> yeah, I know there's been a lot of talk about like allyship and what that looks like. And very tired of like explaining to people like how to be a better person. And honestly, like your allyship, you should start an allyship and um, being able to like sympathize with communities that you're not a part of, but you should move in the direction of being an accomplice. Sorry, that's a typo. Um, one story that I like to tell is um, one of the lead founders for DAM, his name is Harry. Um, and when he was sitting in the organizing room for Detroit March for Our Lives. He saw that it was predominantly like older white women from the suburbs trying to organize a march, a young people's march in Detroit. And he just thought this could not do. So what he did was he reserved the space that they were talking about for their march and basically said, if we don't have more young people, if we don't have black and brown people, if we don't have people who are actually from this community to like lead this march, then there will be no march and you can go somewhere else because I have the space and if you want to host it elsewhere, go ahead. Um, and that's how like a lot of like young black and brown organizers got 
to the space of organizing for Detroit March for Our Lives. And that's a story that I love to tell about like, not just allyship, but being an accomplice and being like a traitor to your own privilege, to your own um, identity. And that's why I love Harry and all props to Harry. And allyship is constantly about like, learning and unlearning like through structural steps, interpersonal and internal. And so it does not stop, it is constant. It is something that we are constantly doing for every community that we have to like engage with, be a part of, allyship is continual and it like does not stop. Like, I don't care if you're tired, like I really don't. Cause trust me, like we're like the people who are actually in those communities are way more tired. So like leveraging your privilege is something that we have to do throughout our whole lives. So Claire, take it away. Uh, yeah, you know, allyship, um, kind of like activism is a lifelong thing. You can't just like get into it uh, when you want to get into it. Um, and, you know, with that being said, I, I already mentioned this previously, but it's about educating yourself and learning. You cannot expect the communities that are affected by these issues to teach you, um, nor should you expect that in general. But yeah, empathy and compassion, which we mentioned earlier, but that is really big. So obviously you can't understand Obviously, you don't know what's going on, um, but you can try your best to help fix that and be the voice with those communities. So here are some resources for you guys. Um, the Two of the websites at the bottom are linked in the next slide, um, but a TV show I want to highlight is when they see us, especially if you're a northerner, I love to remind people that racism is an American problem and not just a southern problem. It's actually really crazy and strange to believe that <laughs> the north is not racist um, <laughs> because slavery happened in the whole country. Um, and actually, New Jersey was the last state um, outside of, I think, some states in the Confederacy to abolish slavery. So, yes, keep that in mind. Um, yeah, these are, these are just a few resources that we put together, but you can find resources anywhere. Literally the anywhere. The slide says, Google is free. The, intele the intellectual labor of Black people should not be. So I really don't want anyone like unless you have a concrete question to like come well, what book should I read like what should I watch like like growing up as a black girl like you find resources and everything like I was radicalized by Avatar The Last Airbender, Star Wars, and Codename Kids Next Door and from there like it all began and it's just led to one thing after another so find what you can and support how you can and we do want to like wrap like hurry so we can get some questions in. Yeah. I was just gonna say Brooke was radicalized by Avatar and I was radicalized by Mighty B. So if that gives you guys any indication of the diversity of this group. Um, just a couple of really important reminders. We're having a phone bank session from seven to nine. Um, we will be calling for justice for Elijah McClain and Breonna Taylor. Um, and these two links, as I mentioned, are the ones, are two of the ones that are linked in the last slide and these are linked to how you can phone bank for them so we'll use this powerpoint during that phone bank um and here is the link to uh, here's the link to ayana pressy's breakfast club interview um and this is a really important quote that i just wanted to highlight from that interview the thing that bothers me is the ongoing debate about identity politics First of all, we need leadership parity and representation in government, but we don't need it so that we can pat ourselves on the back about how progressive and evolved we are. It's not about a cute hashtag. Representation matters because you have a diversity of perspective, opinion, and thought around the table. Uh, when you have those things, it informs the policy making. And so when people say that they have a problem with my unapologetically saying that I'm gonna fight for women, and that I'm gonna fight for black folk, that bothers me because it's not something that I'm saying exclusively. When Speaker Pelosi says, I came to Congress to advocate for the children, the children, the children, do adults get up in arms and say, what about me? And I think that that is, 
Um, something that we should all keep in mind considering the context of why we are here, like Brooke, Claire and I are here and how the organization has treated us and how the organization treats women and women of color moving forward. Um, keep this in mind. And um, again, Black women are not responsible for educating you, especially the activists. I don't know if that makes sense, but we can't be educating every single person that asks us a question and out on the streets at the same time. So a wonderful HSDA member uh, out of Georgia, Sadie, has put together a really great project for you guys um, where you have the opportunity to read to educate yourself which is what the project is called it's also the name of the instagram where you can find out all the information about the project um, if you go to this instagram you will see um, how to register for a book and the book will be sent to you and then you will send the book to someone else after you read it and internalize information so we're really excited to promote that resource for you guys um, because that's an HSDA member looking at taking a look at her identity and um, using action. So while we take questions, um, these are this is an opportunity, and I would really love to see some of you guys actually using these links. Um, go ahead and donate to some black women that are running for Congress while we take some questions. Also, real, real quickly, I just want to say like, um, Google is your friend. I know we already mentioned this, but there's no reason for you to be like, well, I don't really know what resources to and to not go to. We just gave you a bunch today. So I better not see it on anybody's stories or tweet. I just want to say that. <laughs> Okay, I think we have some questions in the, the Q&A, like, thing for Zoom, and if you guys have any more questions, like, add them. Uh, I can't see the questions, so go ahead and read them. Hold on. I mean, sorry, Brooke. Okay. I see okay. this one. It How says... Should, go ahead. Oh, you can go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> How should we try to educate our friends and family? Uh, respectfully, the same way you educate yourself, like... Um, Unless, if, I mean, if you mean like if they have, if they hold a different political view than you, I'll say this again respectfully that this uh, Black Lives Matter movement, livelihood, is not a political issue. So if they're literally debating you on basic human rights, I just feel like you need to protect your peace and energy because <laughs> that at the yes. end of the day, <laughs> that. that's ridiculous. Yeah, one thing that I had to realize, like, and especially through actually learning about Martin Luther King is that my goal is not to convert like white supremacists and like At KKK all. members. My goal is the white moderates. Um, and so educating your family and friends should be something that's like very personal because that's what like all of this should be about. So the resources that you have, sharing them with, with your family and friends, um, like having mean meaningful con conversations at every single point to like reinforce ideas is really important and really powerful so yeah yeah and like also just to close off on that like the goal is not to get a racist and a black person in the room together right like it's to get the racist to um change their point of view themselves internally and then get help on the outside but like that's not we don't need to make black people uncomfortable if that makes any sense like nobody needs to be uncomfortable to change somebody else's point of views so yeah um next question what is your definition of an activist you want me to just you want to go first or who go ahead go ahead claire i don't know <laughs> my definition of an activist um somebody that just i guess takes direct action like i know you're not supposed to use the, the word <laughs> in the definition but like if you are consistently putting yourself um, on the front lines, and when I say on the front lines, you know, like that could be on social media, but like do more, like donate, educate people, whatnot. But if you are consistently like 
educating people and making yourself known and um, publicly unlearning, I feel like you're an activist, right? Like you're acting. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't really know. It's okay. I think we have time for one more question because we need to end the session. Oh, wait, real quick. Oh, Marion said 6.15, the latest. Oh, okay, period. Um, But what is the definition? What is the definition of an activist? Like, really, like, the definition is very personal because I know a lot of, like, in the past few years, it's been really co-opted. Um, but to me, an activist is a person who centers love, community, and <laughs> love, love, community, and liberation and everything that they do um, and through different lanes of action. And so not just like social media, but also direct action, community organizing, and, you know, sometimes like a tool for, li- for liberation can be voting. Um, so an activist is really just someone who who centers their identity and the way they live their life around justice and liberation in all ways. So, yes. Amazing. Next question. Oh, my bad. Um, You're good, bro. uh, How can non-Black POC work to promote restructuring and pro-Black work in their communities? Well, first of all... Oh, can I... I just yeah, really no, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. want and need to say, call your friends out. Call your friends out. For real. Call your friends out. <laughs> Literally, if they knew that someone other than a Black person cared, then they would change. Understand how sad that is and call your friends out. Oh, okay. (laughs) So I just wanted to say that, first of all, um, especially within POC, like that non-Black POC, um, there's anti-Blackness, okay? Like, even within the African community, which is like Black, but if you understand, you understand. If you don't, educate yourself on it. Anyway, um, there's anti-Blackness. Nobody can tell me different. Like, there's specific words specific phrases different things that you know our parents and grandparents say and it's just not right it's shaming on black culture and livelihood while still wanting to listen to the music and benefit off of inventions and you know certain things like that and so i would say like it's not about making like your work or anything pro-black but it's literally about working for black liberation like that is what you need to um that's what you need to restructure the goal around so educate them unlearn anti-blackness because you may have it as well um but yeah i would say do that anything to add um i think that it's just about like centering black people and the work that you do i mean like even throughout different communities black people have been the leaders have been like the people who uphold structures like especially in like queer communities like let's Latinx communities like Afro-Latino people exist and it's just about like centering not just like culture but history and um like lanes moving forward around people like actually like I don't mean like like we say a lot of things figuratively but like literally centering these people like making sure that their communities have resources have access and have like the ability to speak for themselves like it like a circle you have to center them i don't know like visuals you know um oh sorry i should probably delete these okay uh what activities what activities action could a local high school take towards racial justice so depending on like how far you want to take it um destroying the school to wait school to prison pipeline did i say that right yeah destroying the school to prison pipeline requires abolition if you are not comfortable with that um because i don't want to promote anything i mean if you know me you know where i stand but like i don't want to promote anything and i want everybody to feel as comfortable as possible but i'll tell you that's really where it starts right um police officers in our schools different teachers that may be uh undercover racist and not even like undercover but like microaggressions 
simple things as like the um like Becky can bring a hairbrush to school, but if I bring lip gloss to school, all of a sudden it's a it's a beauty salon. You know, little things like that. So I would say just calling it out, speaking to your principal about certain things that you see. Um, I know one thing that I guess you can do for sure, for sure, a lot of school districts have too many levels when it comes to giving consequences for kids that perform like racist or discriminatory acts. So look into that and start a petition, make some demands, speak to your school board to get that like completely dismantled because it shouldn't take five levels to give kids consequences on being racist, right? So, um, yeah. And remember that these same racists that are in our high schools become doctors and lawyers and teachers. So like, we're not destroying their lives, but if anything, we're bettering the community, like <laughs> prioritize here. <laughs> Yeah, I think like everything that Love and Claire said, 100% true. Like if you see some, like literally just look at your high school or look at your school through the lens of an underrepresented person or community, look through the, try to look through, actually don't even try, like ask a black person in your school, what do you need? You know, if that's anti-racist teaching, if that's to get a few teachers fired, if that's to get cops out of school, like if that's to get, um, and an, an assembly to happen if that's to get you know clubs that center around racial justice like that's what you see is what you work towards like that's new model right there what you see is what you work towards literally um and don't be afraid to like ask for help and to reach out to people be like i see this do you see the same thing and how can we move towards fixing it so i can see the questions uh, now oh okay you can go ahead then yeah thanks claire um, no problem no so we have a question that says, what do you think is the biggest obstacle with developing movements for black rights? A lack of working for widespread change or a lack of wanting to understand that people of color in America are still being discriminated? I would like to answer this question by saying that it's a lack of wanting to understand that the world hates black skin. Oh, a word. Mm. I mean, that, when you guys are trying to understand how could somebody do something like kill people as innocent as George Floyd and Elijah McClain, these sweet, amazing people, some people don't like dark skin. <laughs> like what I'm trying to make you understand is that racists really have a fun fundamental thought that black people, black people are lower class. The conversation just has to stop being about people of color. It's about dark skin. It's about black people. And it's about a disgust that white people have for, for it. Um, and that informs racism. And that is why the movement is moving or has moved slowly. It's because people really don't like black people. <laughs> and I also like, I just want to add in these little things like, oh, the Manny will not be televised or changing the American flag to like, some stupid stuff excuse my language but like or just like um you know making memes or light out of these situations like people don't understand this but it's number one insensitive and number two like you think that you're bringing awareness or and whatnot but literally like you're not an ally you're not like you're not spreading awareness it really doesn't at its core it's not helping for black liberation Right. So that I feel like that's something that we also got to, oh, my bad. I feel like that's also something that we got to understand. Like, it's, it's literally not just like people hate darker skin. I mean, yes, it is. But like, they see it as a joke. Like, they don't, they don't see our lives as we deserve success and prosperity and not even deserve, but it is to be expected. Right. Because we are human beings as well. And I feel like that's the most powerful thing about it. Like, see me as a human being. Not some secondary, like, I don't know, just not secondary, but yeah. 
Yeah, I think, well, I don't think I know across the board, every culture, every continent, black people suffer the most. And I don't, when I talk about black, I mean dark skin. I talk about kinky hair. I talk about wide flat noses. Like those features of black people are the opposite of the beauty standard. And anti-blackness is so like deeply, deep, deeply rooted in a lot of the things that we do that it's hard to even like get to a starting line for liberation. Yes, colorism. Like if you're if you're only fighting for, listening, supporting, and loving black women who look like me, you're doing it wrong, absolutely wrong. And you're not actually fighting for black people. I should not be the standard for black womanhood, and I should not be the standard for black activism. As a light-skinned black person with loose textured long hair, I have privilege. And unless we're going to acknowledge that, then there cannot be even a conversation about black liberation. And the black liberation that we're talking about, like so many times, even in our own community, people want to get to the, the, the end goal is the sort of like power, power structures and power dynamics that white men have. And that cannot be the end goal. We cannot try to get to what white men have in terms of like power dynamics. We have to completely dismantle and abolish the system as we know of it and work from the beginning. The, the goal of activists and organizers is to reimagine a new world. And if you are not using your imagination in any of the work that you do, you are not doing any work. If you can't imagine a world without police, if you cannot imagine a world without prisons, without schools as we know of it, then you are not doing the work and you need to change your mindset because we need to reimagine a, the world completely. And that's where our work ends when there is no more of this new world and there, I mean this old world and there's all of this new world that we have built from our collective power and our identities. And that is so, and that, I mean, again, ties into personal narrative. You can identify moments in your life where you've seen bad stuff happening. You made a choice. Yay. What was the outcome? How can you help other people move forward towards that? Um, our next question is from Corey who says, do you think that the education system fails to properly identify learning disability in a timely manner and that it has an effect on the education to prison to, um, and re, yeah, basically on the prison, school to prison pipeline. And this has a, this is very important because when, um, black children are attacked in schools. That's something that really needs to be understood. Like, especially when like you're one of t one of one, one of five, one of ten black kids in your grade. Like, sometimes teachers really don't care about how you're different, and they they either don't care, or they don't receive the training to understand how to support you, and so. Black kids are often di diagnosed with their disabilities later on. And this is what I was talking about, the weathering effect. Like black families don't wanna allow their children to be analyzed by doctors because they're like, they're gonna ch hurt my child. They're gonna kill my child. Um, they're gonna molest my child. Real things that are happening to, to black kids literally because they're disposable to some people. Um, that's really important. Thank you for bringing that up, Corey. Uh, I wanna try and get through all these questions as quick as we can. As women of color, how do we fight situations where we are silenced and left out of conversations and groups? Claire and Brooke can probably speak more to this, but don't allow anybody to shut you up. Going okay, through. real, real quick. Um, black women of color and black women, not the same, just understand that, uh, or not that they're not the same, but they're not synonymous, right? Um, black women are women of color, but women of color are not black. So just understand BIPOC and educate yourself on that because all people of color go through a struggle, but it's a different struggle, right? So we have to acknowledge each of those struggles. To answer your question though, right, um, what was the question? 
how can I answered it? Wait, here it is. How, as women of color, how do we fight situations where we are silenced and left out of conversations? Uh huh. Right. Groups? Okay. So if you are a non-black woman of color, then you need to be able to amplify um, black women as well. Um, we all need to support and uplift each other, but understand that black women, their voices have been suppressed um, all the way down and as if like, you know, we don't even matter at all. So that goes into POC having different privileges that black women don't have um, as well. But I think you just need to focus on amplifying their voices and being um, an ally in a way, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I hope I said that right. The, the movement for black lives will be intersectional or it will be nothing. Movements period will be intersectional, there will be nothing. And that's about recognizing privilege and building collective power based on who's most marginalized and what we can do for others. Um, it is 6.15, so we do have to end this out, but thank you guys so much for staying on and listening. Um, if you have any question, well, if you have any questions that Google cannot answer, um, <laughs> come to us. <laughs> but if Google can answer your questions, let Google answer your questions. Remember to read, write, think, and do good by everyone yes. all the time. Please. Thank you. And we are, <laughs> Thank yes, you, we love you guys. See you guys soon. Toodles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't know. Do we end this? Uh, I think um, Milo will have to end it. You can do it. Thanks, Miriam. You guys killed it. Just in awe all the time. Um, I love you guys so much. I love you. <laughs> um, if anyone's still on, we will be having another session um, with this amazing group. Um, Tuesday? Tuesday? Yes. Tuesday? No. So, maybe. Yes. yes. Tuesday. Um, Dang, that's a lot of maybes and yeses. Oh. <laughs> Actually, I don't have the ability to end it. <laughs> <Can you? laughs> okay, bye, y'all. Bye.